Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Ahmed. I am a resource scientist at Cohere for AI. I'm really, really happy today that we have Mike Lewis with us uh, for our Fireside Chat series. So let me briefly introduce Mike, then, uh, yeah, we will start. Mike is a resource scientist at Meta AI, working on various research problems in NLP, ML, LLMs in general. Before joining Meta AI, he was a postdoc at University of Washington, working with Luke Zittelmoyer. Uh, he completed his PhD at the University of Edinburgh, advised by uh, Mark Stidman. Uh, and before that, he has a master's degree from University of Oxford. Uh, he was co-authored many, many impactful work, such as Roberta, Bart, Ritual Augmented Generation, Canon Language Models, and more recent works about uh, LLMs. So I will try to touch all these points. Uh, but more importantly, feel free to drop any question in our QA. Uh, we will try to have some time uh, for the questions. Uh, yeah, welcome again, Mike. Uh, we were just chatting like uh, one of your work in during the PhD was really, really important for me because I was working kind of similar topics throughout my master. So yeah, we didn't met, but I feel like I know you uh, for, so, for some time. <laughs> yeah, so you, yeah, so you actually studied in one of the like, two of the best universities in Europe in the world in general. But I would like to start with even before that, like, uh, how did you get interested in, like, I don't know, computers, engineering, or maybe linguistics? Uh, how did you define your start for, for in this field in general? Ooh, um, I guess I got interesting pieces quite young, I guess. Um, maybe when I was eight or nine, we got a first computer in my house, which was a very exciting thing. Um, um, it had a... Um, came with a QBasic, which is um, a very, very old programming language. And I, I had a lot of fun just trying to learn how to hack on that and how to um, make little games, including like little text games, which I guess requires some like very, very primitive forms of I language understanding. I... And then, uh, yeah. yeah. So actually, when I was looking your like your works and I tried to think how you would start, in the beginning, like, was that more about like a computer and like programming and stuff, or you were also more important interested in like a language, linguistics? How do you see that different things? Yeah. Um. So I was, um, very interested in linguistics at school. I mean, there wasn't a lot of it covered, but we did some courses, and it was very interesting to me. Um. And actually, when I was going to study my undergrad, I was um quite torn between which kind of direction I wanted to go in. It's the UK, you have to choose a sort of um, specialty up front, so for your degree. And I really wasn't sure whether I wanted to do more computer science or something studying more with language. Uh, in the end, I would say I'd just do a pure computer science degree, which is probably uh, a smart choice for employability. Um, but during my degree, yeah, I did also, in my final year, there were some courses taught on sort of computational linguistics, and they were very exciting to me as well. I see. I see. That's, yeah. I mean, I think mo for, for most of us, uh, like, interested in, like, uh, computers in the form of maybe games or some programming language and stuff is the starting point. Then, like, we try to figure out language with the, with the computers. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I find it just natural and uh, I mean, organic relation. Mm -hmm. So, as I said, like, you studied in what really the, the one of the two of the best universities. So, I'm really a little bit curious, like, how was your graduate uh, studies in Oxford and Edinburgh. So it was like, did, did you know what you're, you were going to do after those or you kind of also explored as you as you go at the time? Yeah, so I still am very much exploring. It took me quite a long time to figure out what I really uh, wanted to do. Um, the masters I did in Oxford was kind of a, a more general computer science masters. It wasn't particularly, uh, when I was doing it, it wasn't specialized in AI or NLP, though I ended up doing a few courses on that, which were uh, the most interesting ones to me. But actually, after I finished that, I um, decided to just actually take a software engineering job and nothing to do with uh, AI um, and spent a couple of years working there uh, where I got um, somewhat bored just writing code all day and like, I don't know fixing bugs and like writing stuff for, for a company I wasn't very excited about. Um, and then at some point I got sufficiently bored and decided to apply for a PhD instead. And uh, yeah, then I yeah applied to exactly one program and went to uh, University of Edinburgh to 
work with Mark Seaman. I see. Yeah, that's that's good to know because I mean, there is like this. Sometimes we get uh, like lots of people get impression that like uh, the like senior researchers like uh, have lots of uh, impactful work now. Knew from the beginning what they were going to do, but probably this is not the case in in most of the time, right? Yeah, I think not the case most of the time. I mean, uh, certainly not for me. I guess um, it's harder to take the path I took these days. Um, obviously, AI is these days extremely competitive. And it seems um, people are applying for grad school with large numbers of papers before they even started grad school. Um, and I had zero papers when I applied to grad school. Um, it would be harder to do that now. I mean, you do need to decide a bit younger what you need to do. Um, but certainly, yeah, back. So I started my PhD in 2010, and AI was definitely a real backwater then compared to how it is today yeah yeah exactly that's true so it's a little bit more stressful for uh, the junior people mm -hmm. i guess but yeah so i I'm, I'm as i said i'm really curious about your uh, your phd work i will come to that point but just like a kind of see uh, complete your experience in like very broadly so i see that you did a postdoc after the phd mm -hmm. so what was your like a decision process like not going to industry but doing a bit more risk like a academic research in the university yeah, I mean, I guess um, I didn't really have a long-term plan when I decided to do a postdoc. And now again, like most people doing a postdoc would have a clear plan that it was setting them up for an academic job or something. Um, for me, it was more just um, I really enjoyed my PhD research. Um, um, and then Luke Dethelmeyer offered me this position at University of Washington to, to carry on doing similar things, living in Seattle. And that sounded like a lot of fun. So uh, it was a fairly easy decision for me to... Mm -hmm. Go do that. Um, you'll notice the theme here of me not really having a, a great plan at any point and just uh, being lucky with good opportunities. I see. Yeah, available to me. yeah, yeah. But then you you switched to industry, right? So uh, how did you decide to go into industry after that? Right, yeah. So, I mean, I guess um, after a couple of years of postdoc, I've seen a bit of the academic world. Um, honestly, I was fairly sure by that point that the sort of pre-tenure faculty life in academia in the US was probably not for me. Um, it would probably involve a lot of things I'd be less good at and would enjoy less. And also, I was lucky to be offered a job at Facebook AI Research, mm -hmm. where basically they were offering me the chance to uh, research whatever I liked with uh, very large amounts of resources. So um, that was very appealing and it wasn't a very hard decision to decide to go that way i see i see yeah i mean definitely especially when you uh, look back from now to retrospectively definitely now resources and if you still can do research in in such environment it's, i mean it's very nice situation yeah. to be like exactly mm -hmm. nice so yeah i mean the, the title of of our chat uh, will be about like it's about uh, llm so i will come there but before this is i'm quite interested like because in your phd you actually worked something slightly bit different i mean i'm not mm. sure slightly bit or <laughs> yeah it's kind of different because you worked on some sort of formal um, synthetic parsing in the form of categorical grammar with the formal semantics and combining with some distributional uh, semantics i guess in general so when you look back how do you think how relevant what you did back then with now oh, um i mean <laughs> I mean, it was useful to study this. I mean, I, I, sorry. So for context here, yeah, I was um, working on uh, sort of what we called semantic parsing back then, which is essentially trying to map natural language onto logical forms that represented the meaning of language. And um, back then, this was done through a combination of fairly basic machine learning and uh, sort of complex linguistic formalisms um, using one particular called CCG which sort of uh, define how you map between sort of syntax and semantics. Um, in terms of how relevant that is now, uh, I mean, they, obviously the techniques we're using today are nothing like these. Um, um, and honestly, they work much, much better. And uh, now, now we know how to do it. It's a lot easier to make these work. The, the old things we used to do were logical forms and things, were very brittle, very hard to make them work. 
there's lots of trickiness with you took these beautiful linguistic theories which have had if you read the textbooks every example they have like they can beautifully explain how language is working then when you try to apply it to real world language which is much noisier and uh, looks quite different from what linguistic textbooks say then these theories find it more challenging mm -hmm. um so the thing i was working on phd was trying to like figure out how we can actually apply these to um general purpose language which um we may, maybe made some progress with but certainly was a very challenging uh problem um and obviously these days we sidestep all these problems by just uh go with purely data driven approaches and much less uh linguistics in general yeah I mean, my supervisor may get my my previous supervisor may may really get angry with uh, me asking this, but do you <laughs> think that that kind of like a more uh, I don't know uh, like linguistically driven things like synthetic parsing or semantic parsing is kind of uh, like that in the era of this super large language models, or you still think these are there are some places to position those things? That's a good question. I mean, I think I mean I think that needs themselves are probably not so relevant these days though i mean i think some of the lessons from these approaches maybe are i mean like for example um i guess these theories are generally optimized around kind of special edge cases in language like um particularly difficult linguistic things to deal with um like a, a quantifier scopes or whatever and um it's actually not totally clear to me how well current language models are actually coping with these as well, so possibly taking some of the inspiration from these kind of difficult problems, which uh, linguistic theories were have to dedicate their effort to, whereas our current approach is just sort of more focused on trying to understand, I guess, the head of the distribution. And it might well be the case that there are at least lessons there on like what to look for. Now, I mean, now it seems our models understand everything perfectly sometimes, but maybe looking for to linguistics, tell us more about the edge case which is challenging would be interesting. Um, I can even imagine potentially using kind of these uh, linguistic formalisms to maybe generate synthetic data to try and sort of emphasize more of these uh, challenging cases more often. Um, so uh, I think there's potentially some still some I mean, ideas there. And I think it's useful to have a background of this even today. I, I totally agree. I mean, it's definitely, I also wouldn't say they are that, but also like, I think now with the, this language models, it gave us sort of, sort of opportunity that like all these linguistic theories could be more like a connected with the practical problems, practical use with via LLM. So these are actually kind of also give us this sort of opportunities to test as well. So yeah, that's good to know also hear from you. Um, so you have lots of works about LLM. So I will try to touch some, some of them. But from all this before, I think maybe it's not the starting point for you, but as I see from the publication, like Roberta and Bart papers is kind of maybe early works that you start to work on large. I mean, large is an ambiguous term, of course. <laughs> but uh, was that like a kind of starting point for you to like uh, experiment with something pre-training, uh, generative language models and stuff? Right, yeah. So, I mean... I had done some work around sort of language modeling before, but I mean, before then, language modeling was kind of different in that we had these kind of academic data sets, like Wikitext or the Pantry Bank or something. And um, these data sets tend to be very small, but we'd all like to train on the same data and try to um, sort of get the best perplexity or whatever. Um, so I had this work on language modeling, but um, I guess there was this moment when BERT came out when suddenly it became clear that language modeling could be something different and more and like we could, I mean, a lot of the work, if you look at these kind of prior language modeling things comes down to regularization because your data set is quite small. So you, there's all these like clever tricks developed to stop you overfitting. Um, for some reason, it just never occurred to most of us that uh, we, this wasn't a problem that necessarily was worth solving when you can just sort of get all this data and then suddenly regularization you don't have to care about because you just um, have essentially infinite data. And I guess Bert was maybe the first paper. There's some early things like Elmo maybe, but 
I think Bert was really the one that made everyone stop and realize that um, large-scale language modeling on as much data as you can get was very important. But yeah, and when we saw this, we immediately started trying to replicate it ourselves. Um, and, um, you know, it was maybe harder than you might expect for us these days. Um, I mean, the paper is very clear on things, but, you know, um, there were no code bases for dealing with stuff at this kind of scale, so we had to write our own. I've had to learn all the difficulties that come with even moderate scale language modeling. I mean, these are only 400 million parameters or something, or 300, but still, um, when you haven't done it, there's no like, real like information online or tutorials on how to do this, because like very few other groups have ever trained the scale before. We found it difficult. Um, and then, but eventually, like after playing around with a few months, we were able to replicate the BERT results. And then um, uh, Yinhan, the first author, kind of noticed that we just like replicated, but also just left them all training a bit longer. It kept on getting better. So we thought we'd just, you know, leave training even longer and just kept on getting better, which is kind of, I mean, these days that kind of observation is like totally obvious. Um, back then, it maybe wasn't so much. Um, um, it hadn't really been established before that these things just seem to keep on improving. So we, uh, you know, we basically took Bert, we streamlined the recipe a little bit, left the training as long as we could afford and all GPUs that we could get Meta to give us. And that became uh, Roberta. And um, that was uh, a very successful model. And yeah, around then also, I was curious about I mean, one limitation of Bert is it only is a kind of, is an encoder only model, so it's great for classification tasks, but you can't really generate with it. Um, so we um, I also led a project to try to do a generative version, which we called uh, BART. Um, so um, BART is just denoising sequence sequence training. So you take some text, you you know screw around with it somehow, and you try and reconstruct the original version, um, and yeah, it turned out this worked really remarkably well. And it's like kind of the first time, I mean, it's basically the first time in LPLC in like generation working in a really convincing way. You could like ask it to um, take moderately long news articles and summarize them. And summaries were just beautiful, showed what seemed to be actual real understanding. And this is like the first kind of time I actually, I actually felt like seeing like real magic and NLP models, being able to interact with them. Of course, like other models like T5 came out around the same time, also showing uh, similar types of things. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a couple of things you said that's quite interesting, like training longer sounds super familiar <laughs> for <laughs> most of us, probably not, because I mean, it's one of the recipes that you train longer. It seems all these la super large language models as well keep improving and improving. Uh, so there's something yeah. nice. But, uh, sorry, but uh, go ahead. Go ahead with that. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, um... <laughs> I mean, these days our recipe is quite simple, right? We just like take as, as much data as we can, get as big a model as we can, we train as long as we can, and we know it keeps getting better. Like, and because it's like so simple and sounds kind of appeals to our intuitions we have these days, it's like easy to forget that like this wasn't like obvious or intuitive at exactly. all to hardly anybody. Um, certainly 10 years ago, maybe less than that. And it just, uh, yeah, it took a little while to figure these out and build these intuitions that we all now take yeah, for granted. Yeah. yeah. For actually, I, I was also curious, like for BART, because this is, as you said, like one of the first, this generative uh, pre-trained models. Uh, mm -hmm. sort of thing. So did, did you kind of had had a, like some sort of uh, maybe guess or a kind of educated guess, of course, in, in, in your case, these models may became something what we have today, because this is not anymore like academical oriented, something really shaping the, how we live? Um, it's a good question. I mean, um, I mean, broadly, no. I mean, broadly, we didn't, I did not imagine <laughs> anything like what we have today, what, five years ago when we were doing BART, um, six years ago or something. Um, yeah, I did not imagine this. I mean, I think there were some things we were trying which are similar. Like, uh, we didn't make it into the paper, but I actually spent quite a while playing around with what we think of us prompting these days so to try and make the model uh, do things by sort of changing the input to make it 
sort of solve tasks better. Um, uh, the mistake I made was I didn't think to try this in context of few shot learning. We were doing it in um, with supervised learning, so like you had less of an impact there, and I kind of concluded that this doesn't really help. Um, so I, I just yeah, I did not have the imagination to think that few shot learning would be a thing. I applaud the OpenAI guys who conceived of this. Um, um, I mean, back then, I mean, the whole world was, yeah, doing supervised learning was how you got good results for things. Um, also, I mean, even if you told me few shot learning was a thing, I'd be like, why does this even matter? I mean, surely it's not that hard to get a thousand or 10,000 examples for any problem. Mm -hmm. If you actually care about what, why would you even bother doing it with few shots? So I, it shows how These ideas which seem so clear and obvious now, um, I, plenty of them I did not think of. Yeah, I see, I see. But also, like, is I find also quite uh, uh, like a interesting this because we also kind of circulate time to time because uh, back then it was like a supervised fine tuning was the big, biggest thing. Then fifth shot learning comes like kind of surprise as you said like and it was fascinating right with only a couple of shots model was able to doing stuff but now we are i feel like we are also circulating back to paradigm of supervised fine tuning in a different form mm -hmm. so that's uh, i mean yeah it's kind of new in some aspect but also not super new in another aspect actually right yeah yeah i mean a lot of the stuff yeah all of these ideas are still useful today yeah like, um yeah, we went a few shot, now we're back to supervised, and there's RL coming on top. Um, exactly. In, in the end, there's not all that many ideas going around. They keep sort of the, the useful ones keep coming back in different forms, but. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree with that. So now, oh, it, going a little bit more deep into like an LLM your work on LLMs, uh, as I said, like there are really multiple aspects of uh, like a directional work you did. But one direction I can see uh, from the, your publications and works is like a kind of non-parametric language modeling in mm -hmm. different well, retrieval augmented generation is one. Uh, you are one of the co-author of this, uh, the, one of the big, like a, one of the first work, I think, on that. Also, uh, KNN LMs with different use case vision translation also directly language modeling. So how do you position this non-parametric modeling with the current form of modeling? Yeah, good question. So um, this will again sound slightly old fashioned by today, but I think there might be a nugget of truth in it. But um, so I guess when we started to scale these models up, or even when we thought 400 million was a very big model, um, I was kind of curious about why the models actually really needed to be so big. And I guess one of my theories to that was that like most of the capacities we use for like memorizing world knowledge. So um so world knowledge is like very hard to compress, lots of facts. So you need lots of parameters to do it with. Um so I was kind of curious about retrieval augmentation as a kind of a alternative solution to that, with the idea that you end up with a language model which kind of just knows the just understands language and linguistics, but doesn't need to like memorize all the world's facts. And um, you will sort of augment it with some kind of um, data store, which in one form or another gives it access to the world's knowledge. So I mean, in some ways that sort of intuition is like still present in today's rag systems, though people are very much, for the most part, abandoned the idea that you just want a small model that doesn't know anything, and like, why not have a bigger model or as big a model as you can afford to have? So, yeah, we we tried this in a few different ways, and we tried um, uh, this model called KNLM, which I think is still nearly state of the art on Wikitext, where basically um, you'd almost do the simplest possible thing where you just take run your transformer language model, then do nearest neighbor in word embedding space from the language model, and use that to augment your distribution so you can have a look in the training set for a similar context to the one where you're in now and just copy the word over. Um, this actually works really remarkably well um, considering you don't even need to train it. The uh, catch is it's really painfully slow and expensive, but maybe that'll be solved one day with some breakthrough in uh, nearest neighbor search, but for now it's um, sort of works well, but not super practical. 
Um, I and mean also like in this, um, with his work on retrieval augmented generation, which uh, looks a lot close to what we do today, where um, yeah, individual version, yeah, we just uh, did some retrieval of text and like use that as to augment the input to the BART model. And um, that worked great. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, even though um, so this RAG framework is very widely used today, one of the challenges we actually had in the original paper was finding enough applications for it. Like most of the original, most of the benchmarks we had back then didn't really seem to fit this mold where you want to do generation conditioned on some retrieval knowledge. So um, one of the challenges, yeah, was just finding ways to evaluate it, which always made me worry it wasn't even going to be that useful, though uh, it turns out like, it's now very widely used and it's extremely useful. So again, shows what I know. Yeah. Also, like, I mean, it is not a new and it's widely used now because our current LLMs have like a problems, right? Like partiality or hallucination mm -hmm. and RAG uh, really fits in, in that context, right? I'm, I'm not sure this mm -hmm. is the ultimate solution, but what do you think? Like such uh, like a two faceted uh, solutions is the ultimate solution for this hallucination or factuality kind of problems or another way, like there are also uh, somewhere to look at to find the, the ultimate solution. Right, yeah, I'm not sure if they're going to completely solve the problem. I think they definitely help. I mean, the problem they help with really is like mean language model doesn't have to memorize so much many things, which has reduced the chance of it making stuff up because you uh, it's got a bad memory. So it certainly helps with that. Um, of course, it doesn't just about you conditioning on some text not guarantee that what you say is going to accurately reflect what's in the text. I mean, still to some extent, you're still kind of hallucinating all the way, but at least they'll be grounded in what you retrieved. So I don't think it solves the whole problem. I think the problem of actually making language models say things which are true is more than just whether they know things or have access to the information or not. I think there's something, I mean, more subtle going on there. Um, in the end, well, if we just sample the model, then in principle, we can generate, we can sample any string. Um, so sort of how we steer them towards ones which are true or how you optimize find decoding procedure or do reinforcement learning or whatever else you're going to do to try and take a language model that has access to information and then it actually accurately reflects that information and what it generates, I think it's still uh, not solved and still needs, it's still a super exciting and important problem to work on. Yeah, yeah. actually, uh, now I would like to take one of the questions because it's very, very fitting in this context. Uh, so uh, Lucia asked actually, uh, she would like to hear what you think about Gemini's 1 million token context window, but I, I would like to extend a bit, like uh, not only Gemini's 1 million, but like this long context, uh, work and what it means related to rock. What what do you think about that? Right, yeah. Um, so firstly, like it's super exciting they did. So that's great work. Um, it's very cool. I hope we can uh, open source models can catch up to this soon. Um, in terms of what it means for rag, I mean, I think I haven't looked at this very closely. I see on Twitter some people are sort of pushing these things in opposition with each other, and I'm not really sure if that's the right way to frame it. I mean, um, at the very least, if you have a long context window, you can do rag better, you can retrieve more, feel it, you know, reduce the dependency on your retrieval model, getting the right thing by just retrieving more things and throw it all in the context window and let the model reason over more stuff. That seems uh, great to me. And maybe we're in a world where like, rather than rag just retrieving like small chunks of text, we can go to, if you get a question, you can like retrieve every archive paper published on the subject, put them all in your context window and reason over those. So um I think um it's great for rag. We should like let's just do more ambitious things on top of rag. So uh that's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean uh, let's see uh, if anything comes up more, please uh put in the QA. So I, I would like to jump something uh, relevant but uh, slightly bit different from uh this context is about efficiency and uh, co conditional computation, because I also see you have mm -hmm. uh, lo lots of works, like from Demix layers, branch chain merge, mm -hmm. uh, base layers uh, mm -hmm. in the context of MOEs. So mm -hmm. I personally work on that and I'm super interested in, especially like uh, 
MOEs, uh, like a standard MOE is super interesting, but like branch chain merge also kind of MOE uh, mm -hmm. type of, uh, modeling, but this is also different. Uh, so first of all, maybe maybe I can start with, uh, especially like in, uh, with the mixed cell is, I mean, MOE is not new, but uh, there is a huge interest now because mm -hmm. of different things. So I, I, do you think this is really interesting or one of the way to go as well? Or how, how, how do you see this uh, interest around MOEs? Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, it certainly seems MOE is fashionable again. Um, so I mean, MOE is very exciting, very interesting. I think, I mean, since the original Transformer came out, what twenty seventeen, we've had really very, very few changes which actually show really promising improvements over the Transformer from an architecture point of view. And MOE is definitely one of that very select set of changes, which it seems like it really has a scope to. Be a step change improvement on top of language models of oh, transformers. Um, so I guess the last time MOE was fashionable was what, 2019, 2020, when there was kind of a flurry of techniques coming out, like uh, the switch model and the G shard model and base layers and a whole bunch of other things. Um, and yeah, we, we were all very excited because, you know, we could actually convincingly be baseline transformers. But then I think there's an experience which quite a few different research groups had when they tried to sort of scale these up to foundation models scale. And um, it turned out to be a lot harder to do than we'd expected. And, you know, uh, I know a few efforts here, some of which I was involved in, which are mostly they're not public because the models ended up not being good enough. People didn't end up publishing them. But um, yeah, there's kind of, there were definitely a lot of smart people trying to scale these models up. And um, in the end, there wasn't a lot that was really convincing that actually did come out there. And um, for the most part, people in the end concluded it, who were trying it then, concluded it wasn't worth it. The kinds of problems you have are things like these models are significantly less stable to train. Uh, model training used to be... Uh, very unstable in general. And we'd have all these kinds of issues with models diverging and training even big dense models was quite painful a few years ago. It's a lot easier now with new techniques. Um, and adding in the MOE made things a lot worse than that hand. So, I mean, you could in the end just have a bigger dense model or a smaller MOE model and generally the bigger dense model uh, did fine. Um, there's getting all kinds of infrastructure complications with doing MOEs. Um, a lot of the infrastructure has improved since then, but it's, it's hard to do. But um, in the end, after a few times, I think I think it's fair to say the at least consensus of people I talked to was MOE wasn't worth it at scale. Um, that consensus I think has changed quite a bit in the last few months, um, where suddenly uh, Gemini one point five and mixed drill are showing very nice results with MOE models. So that's certainly quite exciting. Yeah. Um, so I, I think this is a great time to yeah revisit this and uh, sort of see if these assumptions we made a few years ago or we made a few years ago are still hold or um, these models are worth investing in more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that definitely makes sense because like really this uh, training stability issue was one of the kind of troublesome making troublesome training like super large moes but actually i i would like to touch something also uh, <laughs> slightly different than the stability like in the moes although they are like kind of modular because you have multiple experts but the in my opinion like the, the main idea when you start like for the standard moes like uh, have efficiency because like with the super large model you can actually dispatch the the computation load on multiple multiple <laughs> experts right rather than <laughs> having separate specialized experts. Mm -hmm. But in, in the framework that uh, you kind of uh, started with like branch train merge and mm. uh, cluster branch branch train merge, these are slightly bit different because specialization is a bit more on the front rather than yeah. dispatch. Right, yeah. So I guess branch train merge was kind of a response to these earlier problems with the MOE models. So um, a typical MOE model, essentially every couple of layers you have like, a, you learn a routing function online, which learns how to send different tokens to different uh, parameters. And then uh, you sort of try and optimize this jointly. And it's kind of 
hairy because you can't really get a proper gradient through your router without losing efficiency. So you have to do some approximation and maybe it's cause instability. So branch stream merge was a different approach where we're basically just trying to come up with absolute, the simplest formulation of MOE we could and see how that works. So in that approach, essentially all we do is you um, take your corpus, you divide it up into sort of coherent domains somehow. So the simplest way to do that is just, I know, you, based on your data sources, you divide it up, so maybe you have like a, a news domain, a Wikipedia domain, or um, a code domain or something. And then you essentially, maybe you train a, a, a language model like normal on all the domains for a while, but then you, at some point, you branch the model and that just continue training different versions of the model on different domains. And that kind of captures some of the main advantages of um, MOE models that you get, you get a bigger effective model because it's, um, you get sparsity. But, um, so without increasing your compute, you can uh, effectively have more parameters because they're not tied across different domains. And so you get the, sort of maybe the big selling point of MOE is that, and you also avoid a lot of the pain here because you're not actually having to uh, learn routing functions, which is hard and potentially contributes to instability. And in the end, you're actually just training a bunch of dense models, which we know how to do well. And um, that makes it actually a pretty pain-free way to do MOE. Um, so, I mean, there's obviously trade-offs here compared to the, the more standard approach to MOE. I mean, in the, for example, this approach requires you to essentially tie your choice of expert over the whole sequence and actually over every layer. Whereas conventional MOEs let you sort of choose uh, a different expert for every token and for every layer. So it's, it's a lot less, less expressive in the sense that like um, the normal MOE can express the branch tree merge formulation, but not vice versa. Um, but I think it's still not obvious to me if you actually really need this expressivity and like if it's actually buying you enough to justify the additional pain there. Um, I think like, I don't want to like sell branch train merge too much. I mean, we haven't like a jury still out on which way is the right way to go mm -hmm. here, but I think this is a promising way to investigate, which like hopefully gets you the big advantage of MOE without the major pay point, pain points of MOE. Yeah. I mean, I, I also, I mean, it's not about like a, a really uh, putting more front, but uh, I, I feel like this has a really big promise with the, this kind of framework. And I don't see much of a reason why not like really scaling even on large larger scale, and with a different maybe modification and stuff, uh, it would be really uh, working well because I mean, MOE now also works well. Yeah, yeah. I guess another thing I say is like I mean like um, these days as well. Like when we release Llama two, there's like know, dozens or hundreds of models which train on top of Llama two, where people essentially take it for their own domain, like medicine or biology or whatever they're excited about, and they sort of fine tune the model on that and. It gets a lot better on that domain. So people are actually naturally kind of doing this kind of thing anyway, where you could let the model like sort of dedicate its full capacity to some particular domain. And then potentially like we can take these models and try doing merging on top of them, and try and get some model that sort of captures the benefits of all these other models people are training. So um, I think it actually fits in fairly well with what lots of people are doing, though still exactly the right way to set this up, particularly for merging. I think it's not quite clear at this point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's really also good uh, kind of uh, uh, pointer for for uh, for our audience to maybe where right to look at it for the, like future mm -hmm. research and stuff. Yeah, that's uh, really nice. So maybe also kind of in context here, thanks to Lucy, another question uh, mm -hmm. in relation to size of the training data set and models. Do you think that the compute is problematic at this point uh, related to scal uh, scalability uh, and at the heart of that semiconductor chips production? So maybe like even more broadly. Where do you think this, uh, like a compute memory uh, and like scaling the models even larger? What are the pro problem points as you from your um, expert? I would say the problems are different to the ones people probably think we have. So, I mean, um, I guess my whole career I've always felt I'm limited by compute and like we, n we never have enough GPUs, whatever. Maybe that's somewhat true, but um, I mean, particularly at Meta over the last, 
year or so, it's become very clear the companies are very excited about uh, large language models and want to take this seriously. Um, I'm not quite sure what to say publicly here, but like I mean, if you like Mark Zuckerberg, I think announced we're buying hundreds of thousands of GPUs worth of compute, and that's um you know the best these models these days are not trained in anything like hundreds of thousands of GPUs. Uh, but I mean the ambition has to be to get there in at some point over the next you know, year or two, and. I mean, that's very exciting, but like introduces a whole set of new problems, like how, how we actually train on this extreme amount of computers. Um, um, I wouldn't, I mean, I'm not sure anyone's really trained that scale before. It's not clear how to do it, how to make it scale efficiently. Um, these are all kinds of research problems we'll have to solve, but like the problem is maybe isn't going to be a lack of compute so much as actually figuring out how to use all the computes, we're guessing. Can we say that uh, like the compute is not the the only thing that I mean, when you have an infinite compute, you cannot you can generate the best. It's not that straightforward, I guess, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Just like being able to harness all this compute is suddenly a challenge because like, the amount of compute you're getting is like uh, seems to be growing very, very rapidly, uh, much more rapidly than next I've experienced at any point in my career there. So, um, figuring out how to actually make the best use of this and what the right if we need to adapt the model or anything about our training recipes to do this, or if we can just it's just an infrastructure problem to try and make uh, this all scale. Um, mm -hmm. I think is really exciting. Yeah. So I I would like to kind of close this uh, LLM uh, research uh, discussion, but I have one more thing to ask. Mm -hmm. I want to ask this because you have also worked on like a alignment in like in the form of instruction tuning with a different methodology. But one of the paper uh, that you also co-author with uh, with others. Uh, you say actually pre-training is one of the most important parts in the Lima paper. Mm -hmm. Even the really small set of like instructions you can actually align pretty mm -hmm. well. So maybe can you briefly tell what is your experience with that? Because I mean, this was really a nice uh, kind of feedback from the paper, I guess. Yeah. Um, I guess like the Lima paper is a bit opinionated, but I, I actually think it's probably mostly, I think it's, there's definitely some truth in that. Um, I think. Uh, we call it like the superficial alignment hypothesis, which is basically the hypothesis that the model learns everything it really needs to know during the pre-training. And alignment is more about just like telling it which part of the things it learned during pre-training it should use and which bits it should forget. So the model learned all the knowledge and all, all the different styles of speaking and all the ways a language model might act when it was reading the internet and you just but with a raw base model, it doesn't know which of these you want to use. And like, obviously not all the text on the internet is stuff we want the models to reproduce. And the idea, the claim in Lima is basically that with a relatively, or a very small number of examples, you can just tell the model which style it should be imitating. And that gets you um, a large fraction of the benefits you get from alignment. Um, so, um, I mean, I think there is some truth in this. I mean, I think it also goes with the general trend in the field has been that really the big improvements we've seen, the step changes have been from better pre-training and like figuring out, yeah, even going back to things like Bert and Roberta or Bert and um, carrying on to today's big models, like the uh, the vast majority of the compute people use during training is on a pre-training stage. Um, and... I think models vary in how much resources people put into the alignment step, but um, I mean, for example, I, I generally don't think we should be trying to teach the models new knowledge during fine tuning very much, um, just because the amount of data they see during fine tuning, even with like large SFT data sets, is still really negligible compared to what they see during pre training. I so, to some extent, I think you kind of have to rely on the model when it learns what it needs to know during pre-training and alignment is close to being kind of a stylistic thing where you just teach it to like act like a, a helpful chat things honest rather than just you know, sampling random internet text like it would do by default. I see, I see. Yeah. I mean, can we, can we say like a, in the pre-training, maybe it's, even if not like a constraint, but like it's kind of uh, like the pool that 
what model can do with maybe like a fine tuning, regardless of the data size, probably still you are limited in that pool, right? Uh, rather than like really teaching something completely new. Right, yeah, yeah, I think that's probably true. I mean, obviously there's like, there's limits to this. I mean, if you're going to take trillions of tokens, GPT-4 output or something and like fine tune a small model, that probably is probably going to be quite good at replicating that kind of style. But like, I don't know, in, in the sort of normal assumption where you're pre-training computers, several orders of magnitude bigger than your fine tuning compute, I think you have to rely on the pre-training, doing all the heavy lifting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and fine tuning being kind of, like, Jan has a metaphor about doing like the icing on the cake where the pre-training is the cake. Uh, nice, thanks. Thanks uh, for like the, uh, also the kind of explaining uh, the message there. Now I want to jump maybe like a couple uh, minutes, five or so more interesting part, because these are also like me and also our audience probably kind of interested. Uh, something that I saw, you have lots of works, I mean, probably uh, at the same time. So how do, how do you manage your time? Like how do you work on multiple projects at the same time? This is something I mean, really nice to know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I, I guess, um, yeah, so, in my current life, I'm actually not doing so much of that. I'm currently um, actually quite focused on the pre-training for Lima 3. So I'm actually doing the amount of publishing up this year is likely to be dramatically less than previous years, but um, hopefully it will be worth it. Um, but yeah, in previous years, um, how do I do this? I mean, the I don't know. honestly, the main thing is being incredibly fortunate of having lots of smart people to collaborate with. Um, I'm very lucky to be in the environment I was in and uh, Facebook AI research where we have um, lots of brilliant scientists and engineers who uh, were all trying to publish papers and as well um, worked a lot with my students at University of Washington who were sort of affiliated with FAIR and also had interns as well. So there's many, many potential collaborators, which was great. Um, so I guess it's kind of a skill which I learned over time, which took me time to do, where you're essentially, you spend all day sitting in meetings with smart people and you kind of, every 30 minutes, you bounce around to a new smart person and you kind of sort of context switch to the problem they're, they're worrying about and they sort of, they've been stuck on something all week and they expect you to just remember what they're doing and figure out how to solve it in 30 minutes, then jump on to the next meeting. So. Um, I don't know, this is, it took me a while to learn how to do this, but it's a skill you can practice. Um, um, but yeah, I mean, also, I guess, uh, working with all these people on all these different projects is just, uh, really good for me because I got exposed to so many ideas and inputs and like got to work on so many different topics that, um, I don't know, saw so many different experiments. We thought were great ideas that failed and then we learned from them and like this kind of environment is just great for learning really quickly in and getting much better intuitions and then um I know, you get better at it and more people want to work with you and uh yeah i mean if, if you're lucky enough to be in this kind of environment it's a yeah really yeah great place I think to that's, be that's really nice that you said like this is something that you learn right and i mean <laughs> With a different form, different shape, with different medium, but at the end, like this is really learning how to switch context more frequently than pre before. So yeah, definitely. Uh, but also another thing, like not about only like a kind of doing multitasking, but also in your level, like uh, people also think like how senior researcher work, uh, like in practice, like are you still doing something coding time to time or mostly you advising or supervising? How do you define your work? Right, yeah. So for... For a long period of time, I said my ideal was I spent half my time coding my own project and half my time in like lots of working on lots of different projects, helping out advising people. And I think that that was a good ideal. It was a good model. Um, um, that is not really how I manage to do it these days, sadly. Uh, my amount of time for coding has been sort of steadily eroded by other things, um, which is not a good thing at all because, I mean, I think there's a lot of value in writing code yourself when you're in experiments as well as talking to other people because you, you you learn a lot that way as well. You learn better intuitions by being actually close to it and like 
I think it's much easier to advise people on how to do a job if you this is a job you're also mm -hmm. doing yourself and um so the fact I can't do that so much these days is bad though I try to carve out some time for coding um but one thing I found was like when you're when my coding time is down to maybe one day a week or less then it actually gets a lot harder to make meaningful contributions like all your projects just take forever to do because you never have enough time to work on them and you know it takes a little while to ramp up for them or maybe your coding time is like sort of the occasional half hour break in all these meetings it's just um context switching to that is another challenge so i guess i found like once my coding time got down to like one day a week it was effectively zero days in productive time um so yes i i recommend everybody fights hard to avoid this happening and <laughs> stays coding as long as they can um i would yeah right now i have a little time for coding i really want to try and correct that yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a kind of initial, I think. But yeah, I, it's good to also hear from you that this is kind of something really valuable still in that level. So I have now like really one kind of one shot questions. Maybe it will take in total uh, one one minute or so. Then I will come to the question again. These are like a really one word answers, um, something like that. So first thing, who inspired you at most when you're researching or maybe showing the, the possible path for you? Ooh, um... Good question. I mean, like, I guess different people inspired me in different ways. I mean, I want to particularly shout out to Luke Zettelmeyer, um, who uh, was like, a long time collaborator. I moved to UW to be a to work, work as a postdoc with him. I've worked with him since then at Meta as well. And I guess, like, uh, Luke's an inspiration in terms of both, like, how many problems he can work on at once and do, like, do really high quality work in different areas and also just, like, how to. Showing how you can be successful while still being an incredibly nice and kind person. You don't need to be, again, there's no excuse for being sort of cutthroat to get ahead. You can just be the world's nicest person and uh, still do great work, still have a great career. So that's a real inspiration to me. That's very, that's, that, that's very nice. I mean, probably you are really lucky to work with, to work with him in that case. The second one, um, like, can you name a paper that you, you find very influential for you, of course, subjective. Oh, um, CCG maybe. <laughs> um, I'm maybe less influenced by that these days, sadly. Um, uh, let's see. I think the ones which are most influential, the ones that have been real like paradigm shifts and made everybody. There have been a couple of times I've seen the world has just stopped when new papers come out and everyone has to do different things because everything we're doing before. Was irrelevant. I would say papers in that category include uh, the original Seek to Seek translation uh, work by Tetskiva and Vignoles. Um, I would say includes the Burt's work. Um, I would say, particularly the GPT 3 paper, I think was one that really made people believe in scale, that like magical things like few shot learning would uh, really appear at scale. So I think, I think these kinds of papers are the ones which I. Uh, I think it'd be most influential to me and the whole field. Okay, nice. And this is the last. Uh, then uh, I will come to the last qu uh, question from, from our audience. Um, what is the most influential paper of you? What would what would you recommend us to look at just after this uh, chat? Oh, that's a hard question. I might. <laughs> um, I don't know. I, I I think it's really hard when you write your own papers to even judge the. Impact. I mean, um, the ones that have the most citations, the thing like Bart and Roberta, which um, I think they got citations less because they're like particularly original ideas, and more because um, we you know, trained high quality open source models and released them. So that's a form of influence, I guess. I'm personally more proud of some of the works, which are maybe more creative, and even if they weren't, didn't turn out to the right direction. So things like some of the, uh, um. Let's see, what, like the KNLM I'm proud of, like my original negotiation paper and deal or no deal, I, I think I'm proud of, and that has a lot of ideas, which I think are still relevant. Okay, thank you, thank you. All right, and now I will, I, we have two two more questions. I'm not sure we have enough time, but let's start with the first one, then uh, look at the second. Um, 
So uh, our attendees ask like, uh, what is your advice for newcomers in the space who wants to contribute but do not have resources or guidance? Uh, um, yeah, I think it's an exciting time to join the field. I mean, I think there's like there are lots of certainly lots of advice online. Like there's lots of brilliant people who are writing lectures on YouTube or like releasing academic notes and things. And like there's, I guess, lots of places to learn from online. I think maybe contributing to open source models is a great way to I don't know, get experience, get noticed. Um, I think lots of models are very hackable. There's lots of scope for random little tricks which uh, can actually make a big difference. So I think um, if you're starting and you could do that, that's a, a great place mm -hmm. to be. Exactly. Also, like, uh, I think, I mean, although the computer, like, resources are really important, but also there is lots of work that kind of enable uh, newcomers to learn, but also to contribute directly, like a quantization, for example. You, I, I know you also have some works. With yeah, that. Yeah. It's really possible for newcomers to do something as well in the space. So I think it's also very kind of nice time. To yeah, yeah. I, I actually think um, people say you need all this compute to do things, but I actually think in some ways you get it more democratic and that obviously you need huge amounts of compute to do pre-training for language models. But what, if you take a pre-trained model that's been released, then you can get to the state of the art with a relatively small amount of compute yeah. on top of that. So I think there's lots of scope for people to do things that the state of the art now, which maybe wasn't true a few years ago. Exactly. Okay, th this is the last question. Uh, so coming from a research perspective, what do you foresee as the biggest challenge with adapting enterprise NLP solutions? Also, your thoughts on biggest strengths and weaknesses of the current enterprise NLP solution offered by various companies in the marketplace? Oh, honestly, this is a question I'm badly qualified to answer, unfortunately. Um, I, I don't very little with anything you might call enterprise NLP. I mean, I guess the, the obvious thing is, I mean, from my point of view, we're training much bigger, better models all the time. That's great. Um, I think actually doing inference with these models efficiently is going to um, become more and more of a challenge um, for people to actually use state-of-the-art models in uh, realistic settings. So maybe that's the big challenge there. Yeah, yeah. But I, challenge, but also some some sort of like an open problem here, also in the resource rights, because now we have like super huge language models how like and they they are really applicable in the practical situation enterprise uh, uh, like a world but also like in our normal life so to speak so this like a, finding the best way to use these machineries is something that we are figuring out I think at the moment yeah exactly yeah, lots of cool research to do that like quantization or distillation or um, many different solutions or making them sparse or I, I don't know. Um, people should figure this out and I'll be yeah exactly. excited to see. Thanks, Mike. I mean, it was really uh, nice chatting with you. Uh, thanks for having, I mean, uh, accepting our invitation, but also for the really enjoyable chat. Of course, yeah. Thank you so much for inviting me. It was lots of fun. Yeah. Thanks, everyone, for joining as well. Uh, see you in the next uh, chat. Bye-bye.